So I'm, uh, I was asked to give the sort of an introductory uh, talk about uh, clinical oncology um, and to give you a sort of a broad background about uh, what we do and what sort of different areas of oncology are and, and what the sort of big categories are of uh, treatment types and things like that. <clears throat> Uh, and I'm also going to just touch on some of uh, the history of oncology uh, because, uh, as a few of my colleagues point out, I am the history of oncology. Uh, they, they, uh, I'm, I'm here from the year one. Um, if you are interested uh, in a more in-depth, though, uh, review of uh, the history of oncology, uh, for your reading pleasure, I would definitely recommend The Emperor of All Maladies, uh, which is um, uh, written by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is a, a medical oncologist in, um, I think he's in Boston, and he's written a, really an excellent, uh, interesting book, and it was made into a multi-part uh, TV series as well. Uh, now, medical oncology is relatively new. The first medical oncology boards were in 1973, and it basically grew out of hematology. And you'll find as you go along that uh, most departments have a section of hematology slash oncology, that they are together. And the reason they're together is that <clears throat> hematology or the hematologic malignancies like leukemia and myeloma and lymphoma were the first cancers that were able to be treated effectively uh, compa you know, as compared to some of the solid tumors like uh, lung cancer or colon cancer, something like that. Now, uh, so hematology was sort of the grand specialty for many years. Medical oncology was kind of uh, you know, embryonic back in the 70s, uh, but now, uh, largely because of epidemiology. I mean, common things being common, uh, the, the commonest cancers like breast cancer, or prostate cancer, and lung cancer are far more common than <clears throat> acute leukemia and multiple myeloma and so on. So uh, these days, most hematologists, oncologists spend more of their time doing the medical oncology side of things because that's where the patients are. Now, um, you'll hear about Sidney Farber, for whom the Dana-Farber uh, Cancer Institute was named in Boston. And he was a, a physician who first used an anti-metabolite as a treatment for leukemia with the idea that, well, if uh, developing cells have their purines and pyrimidines, if we can figure out kind of a decoy uh, molecule that is like a, a purines or pyrimidines, those might be used to treat cancer, to basically fool the DNA that's trying to divide into, be, into dividing wrongly. And in fact, that's, that's the whole basis for um, uh, anti-metabolite type therapy. Uh, we, we knew that, for example, in World War II, that uh, mustard gas uh, would cause major loss of lymphoid tissue in, in victims of it. And this led to trying to figure out, well, gee, could, if it has this bad effect that we know about, could it possibly be used in much smaller doses for good effect? And so, in fact, nitrogen mustard, although it's not used a whole lot anymore, was a standard for many years in treating lymphomas. Uh, Charles Huggins, who uh, I think one of the uh, one of the groups of the school is called the Huggins Society, uh, but he was a urologist who, who was really the first one to demonstrate the dependence of certain cancers on um, hormonal influence. And so that men who had advanced prostate cancer could uh, have remissions of their cancer by removing androgens from their body. And, by re in, in order to remove the androgens, one had to remove the testes, but it worked and, and it could produce uh, remissions uh, that could sometimes last a long time. Uh, Janet Rowley, another uh, one of my colleagues who passed away a few years ago, uh, was a pioneer in the um, 
in the cytogenetics of cancer, recognizing that um, uh, leukemias, for example, uh, were not random in terms of the cytogenetic findings that they would have, and that certain uh, certain cytogenetic uh, labels, if you will, uh, predicted the behavior of certain types of leukemia. Certain types of leukemia would respond better to certain drugs, or certain types of leukemia had higher remission rates than other types based upon their cytogenetic makeup. And so she uh, was kind of uh, the pioneer of that uh, area. Um, you will hear at times about the so-called Halstead radical mastectomy, and this, was, this is now, of course, a disproven concept, uh, the notion that, uh, for example, a breast cancer, that in women who uh, would eventually perhaps die from their breast cancer, it must have been because the cancer spread by contiguity from the breast to surrounding tissue to further surrounding tissue to other parts of the body. So theoretically, the more radical surgery that you could do by removing the breast and the pectoral muscles and the internal mammary nodes, you would wind up having a higher cure rate. Well, we know that that, isn't the, that, that is not the case. And uh, nowadays, uh, most women uh, who have early stage breast cancers don't even need to have any mastectomy and they can have a partial mastectomy just to remove the cancer because we know that biologically cancers can spread before they are evident. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. So um, the, the evolution, in some ways I have lived through the sort of the biggest um, you know, changes in terms of our thinking biologically. Nowadays, the, you know, the, new, the newest stuff is things like immuno immunology and how does immunotherapy play a role? And, and rather than trying to kill cancer cells, how can we um, stimulate the body to kill the cancer cells by stimulating the uh, immune system? Did you have a question? I have a question. This is kind of cheating, but we have, you know, in the future, another another talk about uh, oligometastasis, and please excuse me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, by uh, Richard uh, Hinsky. And does, does your last point about the whole idea of cancer and spreading kind of tie into this new evolutionary concept of kind of uh, how we think about cancer and its spread, what does spreading mean, and maybe it's not this all or nothing game of once it spreads, you're gone, or like so on and so forth. I wonder what you think about that. Since I, I when I heard that lecture, I thought about you with the, the thing. Well, uh, so we'll we'll be getting into a little bit more of this, but <clears throat> it is generally thought, for example, that people that have uh, advanced cancer, cancer that has spread to other parts of the body, to the lungs, the bones, the liver, or whatever may be treatable for substantial periods of time, but probably not curable mm -hmm. because <clears throat> there's been too much spread. But there undoubtedly are people uh, for whom the tumor burden, if you will, is very limited. And uh, I think all of us in oncology have experiences with uh, a, a small subset of patients who really do have so-called oligometastatic disease, that is, that they have one metastasis or two metastases and that taking an aggressive approach to those metastases as well as a systemic approach, because you don't know in advance whether it's really oligo or whether you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. But sometimes if a patient uh, sort of uh, stands the test of time and that over six months, a year, two years, nothing additional develops, then sometimes we will say, you know, maybe this is a patient who really did start out with very limited disease. Um, and similarly, uh, why is it, for example, that, that we have some women who will have breast cancer today and be fine for 25 years and then a metastasis shows up? Mm -hmm. So what, what's the deal with that? I mean, what allowed that to be under the radar for 25 years? Was it something about the immune system that uh, kept 
kept it under wraps and then something changed within the patient system that allowed it to, to flourish. I mean, these are questions that we still don't have the answer to. Yeah. Uh, now, how do, how do patients turn up? I mean, how do we first meet them? Uh, why do they come to see us? Well, certainly uh, the classic uh, way that we see them is symptoms from their primary cancer. A woman has a lump in the breast or somebody with a lung tumor is coughing or somebody with a bladder tumor has blood in the urine or a kidney tumor has blood in the urine. Uh, and so they may present because of uh, symptoms related to their primary tumor. Uh, and uh, they, they may present, and this is also common, from regional spread, but not from the primary. So for example, um, if a woman uh, has, um, uh, let's say she has a small tumor in her breast that she can't feel, but that there's major involvement of the lymph nodes in the axilla, she might present because of some swelling in the arm or some uh, numbness in the arm, and that's regional spread. Uh, similarly, uh, you all uh, have had anatomy uh, at this point. Uh, with patients with lung cancer, uh, it's very common to have involvement of mediastinal lymph nodes. And you, you know, I realized the joke, what's the mediastinum? The mediastinum's nothing. You know, it's a space in which other things traverse, but there are lots of lymph nodes in the mediastinum. And if, they, if a tumor involves mediastinal nodes on the right side of the midline, that's where the uh, superior vena cava travels. And so it's not rare that a patient will present with a, what we call SVC syndrome, superior vena cava syndrome, due to swelling, uh, due to obstruction of the superior vena cava with subsequent backing up of venous flow into the arms and face and neck. And the patient presents looking like they're, they're bloated and their arms are swollen. And sometimes they even, the patient will even describe this feeling of if I bend down, I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like I have fluid. If they don't really, but it, it feels that way. And conversely, if they have left-sided uh, lymph nodes of the mediastinum, you remember that, um, that uh, a strange path that the left um, recurrent laryngeal nerve takes. It leaves the brain, goes deep into the chest, loops around the aorta, and back up to the left vocal cord. Kind of a design flaw, wouldn't you think? Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, a patient who may have left-sided mediastinal nodes will sometimes present with hoarseness because their left vocal cord, uh, their left recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured, thereby the, the left vocal cord, which ought to be sort of like a violin string, taut, is now floppy. And so they're trying to speak and they're hoarse because their, their vocal cords can't oppose with one another. Um, and another example I have here is uh, that if you have lymph nodes, uh, in the abdomen that are blocking the, uh, the biliary drainage, you might have uh, jaundice uh, as a presentation. Um, we often see people present, and this is especially true in lung cancer, uh, patients presenting because of a metastasis without the patient knowing that there was a primary cancer. Uh, this is particularly true in adenocarcinoma of the lung, which is the commonest type of lung cancer, and patients will present because of um, shortness of breath and they have an effusion, they have a pleural effusion on the same side where the cancer is. Or uh, very commonly, a patient will present because of a neurologic complaint, is found to have a tumor in the brain uh, that looks like a metastasis, and indeed they have an unappreciated lung cancer. Uh, or they present with pain in the hip and they have a lytic uh, a damage to the bone and then they, we go looking for a primary tumor and find it in the lung. Now, uh, so what this tells us is that spread of course can occur before the patient has obvious symptoms from their primary. 
if you take this to its, uh, to its final conclusion, uh, we can have the entity that is well known in oncology of metastatic carcinoma of unknown primary, where, whereby uh, the patient presents because of spread to a bone or the brain or the liver, and you can't find the primary. And so presumably the primary is um, of a size below that which we can see on an x-ray or a scan or below which we can feel it or the patient doesn't have any symptoms. And there's a whole literature on metastatic carcinoma of unknown primary and studies that have been done on this. And in those cases where it's eventually found, uh, where, where is it found? Uh, probably <clears throat> lung and pancreas are the commonest. And in some ways, this is becoming a less common entity because pathologists are becoming a lot more skilled. Well, they're not becoming more skilled. The, the tools they have available to them have allowed them to become more skilled at doing um, immunohistochemical and, and immunohistochemical studies uh, to, um, to help determine what type of tissue uh, led to this um, spread. So, um, uh, so, the, so far we've talked about three uh, ways of presenting with the primary, with regional disease, with metastatic disease, and then the fourth way, uh, which is uncommon, um, but, uh, but uh, still of concern to us is when people have symptoms of what we call a paraneoplastic syndrome, meaning on the side of, of a neoplastic syndrome. So neoplastic syndromes mean that it's related to where the tumor is. If you've got you have tumor in a bone, you're going to have pain there. But a paraneoplastic syndrome means that it's because there is tumor in the body that there is a res response of the body. Either the tumor is producing a substance like a hormonal substance or uh, the body is reacting in an immunologic fashion as sort of an autoimmune phenomenon against the cancer. And so we know, for example, that people who have small cell lung cancer may present with SIADH or inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. And uh, antidiuretic hormone, uh, of course, is what allows you to um, uh, retain water uh, in the kidneys. If you, if you have too much of that, then the um, uh, uh, your sodium level in the blood can go down because you're retaining too much free water. Uh, people with small cell may also have ACTH uh, excess. People may have neurologic syndromes, uh, and there's a, a number of classic ones, uh, cerebellar ataxia and the so-called Eaton-Lambert syndrome. These are sort of a curiosity, and they're usually due to some sort of an anti, an antibody, either a hormonal thing or uh, the neurologic ones are sometimes due to an antibody that's produced against uh, neurologic tissue. Uh, we know that some cancers can produce, uh, in a sense, normal hormones. So for example, we know the kidney makes uh, erythropoietin. That's what keeps our red cells being produced in the bone marrow. But if you have a kidney cancer, and sometimes a liver cancer, you'll have excess production of erythropoietin, and you'll have um, an elevated uh, hematocrit. We don't necessarily refer to it as a paraneoplastic syndrome, but we probably should think about weight loss and loss of appetite as one, because it's not present in every cancer. For example, breast cancer patients essentially never lose weight. Uh, but patients with intestinal cancers and pancreatic cancer and frequently lung cancer will lose weight very commonly um, uh, as, part of their, uh, as part of their course. Um, and another par uh, paraneoplastic syndrome is hypercoagulability, that is increased, sensitive, increased susceptibility to blood clots, uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and most of the time, these are in patients with adenocarcinomas. Uh, we've presumed that the 
glandular forming tissues that produce adenocarcinomas elaborate substances that trigger the clotting system. And this is probably a form of low-grade DIC. We think of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, as a horrific, terrible event that occurs with crises like major trauma or major obstetrical disasters. And that is true, but you can also have a low-grade DIC where you're really seeing the clotting side of DIC rather than the clotting leading to consumption leading to bleeding side of DIC. So we think that, that to some extent the patients who get um, uh, clots related to their cancer um, are uh, having, that, that that's, can be considered a paraneoplastic syndrome. Now, how do we figure out that somebody has cancer? Um, well, we normally you have to get tissue. Tissue is the issue, as the pathologist would tell us. And so how do you, you need a biopsy? So we, we might get a surgical biopsy. So for example, if someone, if a woman has a, a tumor in the breast, we might make a small incision in the breast and, and remove a bit of tissue. Or uh, if there is a, uh, let's say there's a skin lesion that's questionable, you may do an excisional biopsy. That is, you remove the whole thing with the biopsy. Um, you can also, um, we also frequently do a fine needle aspiration. And this is actually one of the centers of excellence we have at U of C, is that we basically have a, uh, an FNA service, fine needle aspiration service. They have a pager. You page them, they show up in your clinic or wherever in 15 minutes, um, and they'll put a needle into anything they can feel, um, uh, within reason, obviously. Uh, and you can get a cytologic answer. You get a, 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 some liquid, some cells in, in a few drops of liquid, and they can give you a, a preliminary answer in just a few minutes, and then within a day or two, you have the, the final answer. Interventional radiology does this as well, that they can put needles into, into organs under image guidance so that they're sure that the needle is going where it's supposed to go uh, and not just blindly. Did you have a question? Well, yes, I have a little bit of a question. So, I mean, there's, there seems to be a lot of options, and I do understand that fine needle aspiration is kind of a quick answer, but it's kind of like, when would you, wh why do the fine needle aspiration at all? Like, why, and if it's not like a final tell-all answer, why would you not just stick with the surgical biopsy? It could be incisional or excisional or any of the next topics. Like, why get the, you know, just for ease of mind, or what is the purpose? Um, naive? It's, well, first of all, the, the capability of pathologists to, to do more testing on fine needle aspiration material is increasing. It, okay. there, it doesn't take a lot of DNA necessarily to run some of the tests that we run, want to run. That's number one. Number two, because it's quick and easy, you can sometimes rule out a problem. In other words, you, you see a lesion, gee, I wonder if this is something of concern they do an FNA, it's benign, goodbye, okay? Now it is true though, that for some diagnoses, it's not gonna be sufficient. So for example, if you're suspicious somebody has lymphoma, there's so many different types of lymphoma and subtypes, and that makes a difference in, in making treatment decisions and staging decisions that you really need more tissue than you can get from a fine needle aspirin. But on the other hand, if you do a fine needle aspirin and, and they tell you it's lymphoma, you know it's lymphoma, you know what your next step is. Mm -hmm. If they do a fine needle aspiration, they tell you it's squamous cell carcinoma, then you know it's probably from the head and neck or the lung, and then you have to get necessarily more tissue. So it may save a more invasive procedure uh, and it certainly may give you a quick answer to decide if you need to do uh, a more extensive procedure. Again, that core biopsies may be needed because very often we need more tissue than just an FNA. And so for example, in breast cancer, we routinely uh, 
have to test tumors for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor and HER2, and uh, we may not have enough material from an FNA, and we need a core biopsy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, when people have malignant effusions, that's a good way to make a diagnosis, and very often you can make a sufficient diagnosis of, um, of lung cancer simply from a pleural uh, fluid analysis mm -hmm. because there are certain uh, histochemical markers that tell you this, er this undoubtedly arose in the lung. Or similarly, if a patient had a history of breast cancer and now presents with a pleural effusion and you drain out some fluid and, and do the various tests on the fluid, you can rule in or rule out breast or rule in or rule out lung and decide that you know this is, this is a recurrence of breast cancer or no, it's not. It's actually a totally new problem and it makes a huge difference in how you manage the patient. Uh, what the, the, our uh, tubular organs are the avenue into the body. Uh, and so we can, uh, uh, bronchoscopies are commonly done in order to do biopsies of lung lesions. Uh, and bronchoscopy is also done with an ultrasound along this, uh, in the tube, in the scope, and so when the operator is, has got the scope in the trachea, for example, uh, he's, willing, he's able to look at the lymph nodes that line the trachea on either side. And if they're enlarged, can pass a needle into those nodes and, and do biopsies. And that's an EBIS, endobronchial ultrasound. Or esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, or EGD. Basically, you put a scope down into the stomach, down into the duodenum. Uh, you can uh, get samples of the pancreas. You can get samples of lymph nodes surrounding the pancreas. And similarly, you can go in the other direction. And, and, and colonoscopy is an easy way to get to um, tissues in that uh, part of the body. Uh, you may have to do an open biopsy. That is, the surgeon has to do a laparotomy, which means open up the abdomen, or a thoracotomy, me meaning open up the chest. To uh, So, uh, like, for example, last week we had a patient that uh, had some lymph nodes on the left side of the chest uh, uh, near the pulmonary artery. Well, the pulmonary doctors can go along the trachea, and if it's a paratracheal node, they can stick a needle in it. But they can't stick a needle all the way from the trachea through the pulmonary artery into a node that's on the left side of that, because that pulmonary artery is not something you can stick needles into, or you can do it only once, shall we say. That's an experiment you, you only try once. So. Um, in that case, the patient needed a, a thoracotomy. Now, what we do these days is what's called a VATS, video-assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgery, which means that these very tiny incisions are made, a scope is placed by the surgeon, and they're able to see the node that they want and take a biopsy. And the patient may go home the next day. Now, this is as opposed to a thoracotomy where you're going to remove an entire lung or a a lobe of a lung, which is a much bigger deal. But my point is that, that going where the money is is often what's necessary. Um, pathologists, uh, you know, the world has exploded uh, in the pathology uh, realm because of, so there's still a need for morphology for sure, that we, we need them to look at the cells. Uh, but immunohistochemistry and cytogenetics and molecular markers, and now we refer to NGS, uh, so-called next generation sequencing. And there's all sorts of companies out there that will do this analysis for us when we send them a tissue. You, maybe you've heard of some of them like Tempus and Foundation One and things like that, where you send them uh, a sample or you send them unstained slides or whatever, and they can extract enough DNA to look for molecular markers. And that's key uh, 
I'm a lung cancer doctor, and there's a, you know, there's a minority of patients with lung cancer, particularly those who have been never smokers, who are very likely to have certain molecular markers on their cancer cells. And if they have those, it, mean, it, it tells us that they can respond very well to some of these so-called targeted therapies, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but they're the drugs that end in IB in their names, the IBS. Um, and those drugs are worthless if you don't have the marker, but they can be dramatically effective if you do have the marker. So we depend on getting those markers done. These are expensive tests, but they've become uh, standard practice now in certain cancers, uh, and particularly lung cancer. Now, staging of cancer. So if I went to a conference with other oncologists and I said, you know, I just treated 10 lung cancer patients and they all survived 10 years. And then my colleague says, you know, I just treated 10 lung cancer patients and, and you know, eight of them died. I must be a bad doctor. Uh, and the answer is no, not necessarily. So the purpose of staging is so that we're comparing apples and apples. Uh, we need to be sure that, um, well, the purpose of staging is not only so that we can uh, uh, compare our results to what we would hope them to be and so on, but it helps us to tailor our therapy. If we know that somebody has localized disease, then we're potentially going to treat them in a very localized way. And if we know they have more extensive disease, Maybe we can save them the toxicity of certain treatments, but make sure that we don't shortchange them and not give them other treatments. So we stage by physical examination, imaging, of course, and you know you hear a lot about CT and MRI, which are you know very effective for staging. Certain nuclear scans, particularly PET scans, are useful. Positive emission tomography. And what happens there is that uh, we have a radio labeled glucose molecule that uh, is injected into the body. And after an hour or so, a camera goes up and down the body and looks to see where there has been uptake, in what tissues has there been uptake of these uh, isotopes. And uh, it takes advantage of the fact that um, cancer tissue is more metabolically active, that is, uses more glucose than non-cancerous tissue, so that we take advantage of that uh, by seeing what lights up, if you will, on a PET scan. And the PET scans are done in conjunction with CT scanning so that you have what are called your fusion images, so that not only do you see like a bright spot on the scan, but you also can anatomically say, well, where is that bright spot relative to other organs? We may do surgical staging, and that's part of a routine, for example, in lung cancer, that uh, the, we'll have the interventional uh, pulmonologist do an endoscopic ultrasound. Well, it, it, well, I'm sorry, for certain, like for esophagus cancer or gastric cancer, they'll do a, an esophageal endoscopy and look at the lymph nodes and look at the tracheobronchial tree. In, the, in lung cancer, we wanna know about the mediastinal nodes because that'll help us determine how we treat. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look at lymph nodes uh, by that method. Um, so that's a mediastin, we may do a mediastinoscopy where we make a small incision at the base of the neck and, this, and the, the operator puts a scope in and can look at those nodes and take biopsies. Uh, laparoscopy is where you look in to the abdomen with a scope and take a biopsy as required. Or thoracoscopy, the same thing that I talked about briefly before. And occasionally an open procedure may still be appropriate. Sometimes all the uh, scans and exams and so on ahead of time don't give you the full picture and it's not until you actually explore the patient that you know all the details. Uh, every cancer, uh, probably with the exception of the lymphomas, uh, has a TNM staging schema. Uh, 
that is uh, tumor is the T, N is the nodes, M is metastasis or not. And uh, it's not possible to learn all of these. Uh, you learn the ones that you deal with every day and you don't have to learn them because there's manuals that are there or you look it up online or whatever. But uh, generally speaking, T1 would relate to size uh, T and T2 and 3 might be bigger sizes, and as you get to T3 and T4 designations, it may not only be size, it may be invasion of adjacent structures. And the N and node sch um, schema may relate to the number of nodes, or it may relate to the location of nodes. The nodes in one area may be called N1, but nodes in another area may be called N2. And then when we're done all of this TNM, we come up with a stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Uh, and again, this, is, this ha is allows us to put people on clinical trials. This allows us to compare our results. This allows us to think about, well, gee, this is a patient with stage four cancer, i.e. it has spread to some other part of the body. It probably doesn't make sense to do a big operation to remove the primary because there's already been spread. So that's what the staging allows us to do. Now, yeah, do you have a question? I do have a question. I'm full of questions today. So I know that you, so obviously we subdivide the different staging schemas by primary tumor origin, but since we kind of already discussed this idea of markers kind of hinting at that, of course, not all lung cancers are the same, not all um, pancreatic cancers are the same. Do you think there's an evolution towards including subdividing staging by marker, i.e. by type of lung cancer, i.e. it's a, a, mark, a lung cancer with this marker is going to use this staging schema instead because it, it has a different kind of pathway in it, or is that kind of too subdividey? No, that's a good question, actually, uh, and I have, I fear that that's going to be coming along. Uh, you has, hear. It, well, because it, it'll make things even more complicated, yeah. but it is, it, it actually has occurred in breast. Okay. Uh, so that in, in breast uh, cancer, there's an anatomic stage, which is what's, what we've had for decades. And, and the, the anatomic staging schema, the TNM, may evolve over time because it may be recognized that actually, you know, the patients with this degree of invasion do just as well as the patients that don't have that. And so sometimes, so there are different additions of the staging. But in breast cancer now, there's an anatomic stage, and there's also a, I can't remember if it's called a clinical stage or a functional stage, but it takes into account, is this estrogen receptor positive? Is this triple negative? Is this What's the grade? Because it ultimately may affect. So yes, you're you are you're correct in in opening that Pandora's box that mm -hmm. uh, a stage one estrogen receptor positive breast cancer may not be the same as a stage one triple negative breast cancer, and in terms of its behavior, and therefore uh, you know be able to say, well, this is the this is the expected survival because you have to do you have to do take you do have to take into account those other factors so it's a good question uh, and it's probably going to impossibly complicate things uh, because for example these days i i go to the breast cancer tumor board most most weeks and uh, the person that's running the conference will will often say you know and somebody else is looking it up because there's this enormous sort of chart that you got to look well okay the t is this and the n is that and the estrogen receptor and so you but you do have to get to it now let's uh let's talk a little bit about um the uh the treatment of cancer uh because there's a variety of ways we do it and this is a, a chart that i i like um that uh that i learned early on um that and is my arrow visible it is visible. okay okay good so we um we think that and not i mean there's there's evidence for this 
this is on the on the y-axis. This is 10 to the zero. Okay, one cell. Okay, and up here is 10 to the 12th, which would be uh, a trillion cells. Um, and uh, we generally think that 10 to the ninth cells is when uh, cancer is clinically evident, uh, detectable, visible, palpable, and so on. And that the, 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 the interval of time in which patients have tumor, the number of tumor cells in their body between 10 to the ninth and 10 to the 12th is, is like is where we're doing most of our clinical oncology. And we think that when one gets to 10 to the 12 cells that it overwhelms the organism and the patient dies. Now, similarly, the concept of remission, when, when we don't have evidence of tumor by exam or by imaging or whatever, it, we presume we're down below 10 to the ninth. Now, if, if you're below 10 to the ninth, are you at 10 to the eighth or are you at 10 to the one? Uh, you know, so, and only time will tell sometimes, but we do know, for example, that a patient could have a lot of disease, okay, up here. We're staging them, they have advanced disease. Let's say we have a very effective therapy that puts them into a complete remission. So that means that we can't see it anymore and we're now down in this, in this, uh, general uh, location now but and they may go the rest of their lives and never show up again with that cancer but it's also possible uh, and this arrow is a little tricky but they they may relapse and and then become uh, evident again and have to be treated again or they may get down to that last cell that got wiped out somehow by the immunologic effect of the body against the cells, or perhaps the drugs were so effective that they got rid of the, you know, every last cell. And there's more and more interest, particularly now in the uh, hematologic malignancies for this concept of minimal residual disease, MRD. Uh, and how do we detect that? Because we know that a lot of patients say with multiple myeloma or patients with acute lymphocytic leukemia may be in remission. That is, we do a bone marrow, we don't see the blasts, they're feeling fine, their blood counts are fine, but we, we know they're gonna relapse. So there's more and more interest in detecting MRD, minimal residual disease, because there are more and more modalities of treatment that may be available to treat MRD to get, MR, to get MRD so minimal that there's nothing remaining. So, uh, but this, this area below in the lower arrow, below the 10 to the ninth, is where, where we are when we're talking about remission. Uh, and that's obviously where we hope they'll stay. Now, what about the treatment modalities? How do we treat? Well, surgery, of course, has been around for a long time, you know. Uh, the, cut it out, then you're fixed, right? Uh, the, you know, I think one year of surgical residency is spent learning how to rip the gloves off and say, we got it all, okay? Now go see Dr. Hoffman, who's gonna tell you more about this. But anyway, uh, surgeons are our friends for sure. And surgery is a key part of treatment because it removes the primary tumor and in many instances cures the patient. Uh, you know, depending on what the stage is. Radiation therapy uh, is another form of local treatment, and it takes advantage of the idea of, of producing um, free radicals by bombarding cells with uh, uh, photons or sometimes particle radiation like protons or electrons. Uh, photons are the usual type of of radiation, the so-called linear accelerator radiation, the old days, cobalt, that was photon radiation. Uh, that is external beam radiation. There, you probably have heard of proton and electron. Again, these are particle radiation where high speed particles, be they protons or electrons, 
are used and they have specific indications. Uh, the proton, there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, the WAGs are saying that it's a modality in search of an indication, but uh, uh, it does have certain very precise indications. Brachytherapy is radiation that you directly put on the tissue. So for example, uh, in prostate cancer, one of the ways that one might treat is to insert uh, multiple tiny uh, seeds of radiation into the prostate gland. And these uh, emit large amounts of radiation, but to a very tiny area. So that you try to kill the cancer right locally but avoid the uh, surrounding tissues like the bladder and the rectum and so on to where that's where the, the side effects may occur. Brachytherapy is also used uh, sometimes in uh, luminal cancers. That is, if you have a lung cancer that where there's a blockage of a bronchus by the tumor, it may be possible to place a radio radioactive um, uh, source there for X number of hours that the physicists figure out. And you're basically, again, putting a very high dose of radiation, but to a very tiny area. Uh, and so that's, but, but radiation is an important part, is an important local modality of therapy. Laser, okay, sometimes we can use laser coagulation for, it's like a roto rooter, okay, if you have a, an obstruction of the esophagus or obstruction of a bronchus, sometimes we can use laser. There's a, a concept of photodynamic therapy where you inject a uh, radio, you inject a drug into the body, which so when it is circulating, you shine a light of a certain wavelength at the tumor and that wavelength of light in conjunction with the drug leads to free radical formation and cell death. Uh, the, the, the places where we use this is in dermatology, for example. It may be used uh, for certain types of skin cancers. Uh, PUVA is the, the um, abbreviation for it, P-U-V-A, Sorolin, P-S-O-R-A-L-E-N, and UV light A. So that, that may be used. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is where the, the radiologist under image guidance passes a needle into a tumor and can then send microwaves through that needle and heat up or freeze uh, a metastatic focus. So these are local forms of treatment. Systemic treatment is what medical oncologists primarily do. And we may have endocrine therapy. I mentioned Huggins earlier about the treatment for prostate cancer and lots of the treatments for prostate cancer basically rely on depletion of androgen. And it could be, we're doing less and less of the removing of the testicles, but there are a, a, a number of drugs that are androgen inhibitors that are available. Certainly breast cancer, if breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive, and most of them are, then depleting estrogen or uh, blocking the estrogen receptor or using other forms of uh, inhibiting the, um, the production of estrogen in the body with say aromatase inhibitors are very effective at inducing remissions uh, and also for the adjuvant treatment of, of cancer. That is to, to prevent recurrence by treating um, microscopic only disease early on or adjuvant suggesting that it's being done like right after surgery. If the surgeon didn't get every last bit of it from the body because there was bloodstream spread, that's why we have uh, um, adjuvant therapies and they made a, they've made a huge difference in, in breast cancer, for example. We have ablative therapies. If you take away the testes, you don't have androgens. If you take away the ovaries, you don't have estrogens. And those are not being used a whole lot anymore, but we have so-called additive therapies. We have selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen. We have aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole. We have androgen inhibitors like 
um, bicalutamide. Uh, and in the old days, uh, not so much anymore, we used to use pharmacologic doses of estrogens for men with prostate cancer. So if you, you're trying to block male hormone by giving female hormone, and even in women with advanced breast cancer, you could sometimes use uh, large doses of uh, estrogen. Chemotherapy, okay, lots of different mechanisms. I mentioned earlier about anti-metabolites, which are basically like the Trojan horse, fool, fool the DNA into thinking that this purine uh, analog or this pyrimidine analog is actually gonna help it make more DNA. Uh -huh, fooled you, okay? Or they're alkylating agents that alkylate the DNA so it can't continue to uh, proliferate. Now, chemotherapy, of course, does have toxicities. Uh, people know about many of them. There may or may not be hair loss or nausea. Uh, the main concerns about them in the short term is that they, they affect rapidly dividing tissues. So what are the rapidly dividing tissues? The hair follicles, the intestinal tract, so people get mouth sores, the bone marrow that's always making cells, so temporarily the white blood cell count can go down and you can have problems. But you can also have long-term toxicities like DNA damage that can lead to second cancers five years later or seven years later. So, it, or for example, uh, some of the drugs may have cardiac risk or pulmonary risk that may show up years later. Immunotherapy. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's, if you go to the oncology meetings these days, it's immunotherapy from top to bottom. Uh, and for good reason. The, the immunotherapy drugs like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, have revolutionized the treatment of certain cancers, okay? They've made a big difference in lung cancer, in bladder cancer, in melanoma for sure, uh, but they haven't made any difference hardly in breast cancer, for example, uh, and not much in pancreatic cancer. So there's still a long way to go, but the, uh, the notion here is that these drugs are taking the brakes off the immune system in the body and making the body fight the cancer. And that's great, but uh, the the downside of the immunotherapy drugs is that it the it may make the body fight the body, that make the immune system fight the body, and so inflammation of the lungs or the heart or the liver or the colon may be the downside of immunotherapies. And the problem with immunotherapy is that anything can happen to any patient at any time. There's no predicting. And so most of the time it's very easy because it doesn't make you ill, doesn't affect your white count, doesn't make you lose your hair, doesn't make you have mouth sores, but it could have a nasty inflammatory effect. Did you have a question? I did have a question. So do we have an indication why these immunotherapies work better for some cancers and not for others? Is there any kind of... Um, cytogenic markers have to do with the DNA. Like, do we know just like the, the physical location and how they get to it? Do we have any idea what causes one cancer to be more um, well, adaptive, if you will, to it versus like a different cancer in a different part of the body? Well, people are, are of course spending their careers trying yeah. to figure that out, but um, uh, well, the theory is I think it becomes a question of whether it's not so much a question of whether the drug gets to the organ, because if, you know if there's blood supply, it'll get to yeah. the organ. But rather, I think it's a function of you know are these. There's a lot of interest in what allows certain tissues to evade immunotherapy. You know, are there cytokines that are produced by the cell that that blocks the immune drug from getting to it, or um, are there um, it, do, does the tumor need to have like lymphocytes surrounding it in order to be susceptible to immunotherapy? There's a lot of unanswered questions about it, but it's a key question because, you know, melanoma used to be a backwater for medical oncologists. There was literally nothing that worked for melanoma. Now, all of a sudden, it's this dramatic turnaround in what's available. Um, and 
On the other hand, breast cancer, where there's an array of options, of endocrine options and chemo options and so on, for some reason doesn't respond all that well to immunotherapy. And I think that some of the research is going toward trying to make the, what can we do to uh, induce the cancer to be more susceptible to immunotherapy? I mean, check with me in 10 years and I'll have a smarter answer about that. Yeah, um, I give it a shot just in case maybe you have some breakthrough <laughs> that I didn't know about. No, no. Uh, uh, the targeted drugs, the IBS, okay, the small molecule inhibitors. Uh, and these are, these take advantage of if you have a molecular marker on the tumor cell, it may tell you that it's susceptible to certain inhibitors, TKIs they're usually called, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that, that target a particular marker. So we have, for example, erlotinib for lung cancer, which is an EGFR uh, target. If you have an EGFR mutation on your lung cancer, you may respond dramatically to erlotinib. Imatinib for CML, which is a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was discovered uh, um, well, actually, Janet Rowley discovered what the translocation was, and then people beyond that figured out, well, what's happening at that translocation chemically that we can target? And so CML used to be a uni universally fatal disease, and now it's quite rarely fatal because we have this TKI, imatinib, and other IBS that have been developed for CML that have really changed the landscape. The MABs, okay, we have the IBS and the MABs. The, the, anything ending in MAB is a monoclonal antibody. So we have rituximab for B cell disorders. We have trastuzumab, which is an anti-HER drug. We have uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. These are the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so those have, made a big difference in many cancers. And what about no therapy, okay? So um, in fact, just this morning I saw a patient who has lung cancer. She has like multiple tumors in her lung, but it's been asymptomatic for two years and has been on no therapy. So we, are, we have just been watching her, we're not treating her. Now, could I, could I make her tumors shrink? I probably could, I probably could make her scans look prettier. But what will be the price of making her scans look prettier? Would I be making her feel worse in the process and taking on toxicity? So knowing the pace of the disease may make a difference. I'm gonna save this, eventually she may need treatment, but at the moment she's had several years of not needing treatment and going about her life in a normal way. So that's the question first. Is this incurable, but we don't have to fix it right now? Uh, or is the natural history such that the patient will die from something else with it rather than from it? Uh, and sa same thing, do we want to, so if, if we don't think we can cure it, we're trying to palliate it. But if there's nothing to palliate, if the patient's not having symptoms, so we might make them feel worse treating them uh, when they don't need it. And then finally, and this is sort of the goals of care issue, is the patient too sick to tolerate treatment? You, one, of the, one of the markers for poor care, if you will, uh, care at the end of life, is uh, chemotherapy in the last 30 days of life or an ICU admission in the last 30 days of life. These are not good things. We need to be able to better predict uh, who really shouldn't be treated because they'll probably feel better and live a little longer if we leave them alone. And, and that's where hospice care may come in. And I would recommend, again, as a, a wonderful book, Being Mortal, by Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon in Boston, but he's also a writer for The New Yorker and so on, and has written some, some really uh, interesting books. Uh, so you're going to be hearing more in this course about the so-called spectrum of cancer care. We have prevention, uh, which I haven't talked about today, but uh, you know I think we, we managed to help a little bit when, when we started pushing HPV vaccine as an anti-cancer vaccine rather than a safe sex vaccine, okay? I mean, because it was it does 
prevent cervical cancer and warts and so on, and that's a good thing, but, but its real purpose is to prevent cervical cancer. Tamoxifen and raloxifene can prevent breast cancer in women that are at high risk, or sometimes prophylactic surgery as appropriate. The next step in the spectrum is screening to try to find the early cancers, or in fact, like colorectal, the purpose of colonoscopy is not to have the aha moment that I, oh, look, I found a colon cancer. The purpose of colonoscopy is to find polyps which if left untouched for five or 10 years would eventually become cancers. So that's the purpose of colonoscopy. That's really more prevention than screening. Diagnosis and treatment we've talked about, palliative care, and then we do need to have a better, uh, this is something we do fall down a little bit on, is survivorship plans. You know, have we really you know, laid out for the patient, these are the things you should be concerned about in the next 10 years. The pediatric folks have been much more proactive and up to speed with this because they know that children that are survivors of, um, of uh, childhood cancers uh, may be prone to later problems. So um, uh, that's my piece. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any additional questions if you have them. Uh, and uh, I appreciate that you're interested in oncology. This is a exciting time to be uh, going into oncology because of all the new things that are available. Uh, and, uh, and I've had the opportunity to observe it over a few decades, uh, but a, a lot of it is gonna happen after my uh, medical lifetime, but uh, you're you're starting out fresh here. So questions? I have two questions for you. So can, since you have seen cancer, the spectrum, and mentality, or talent, what do you think has been the biggest shift in how we perceive cancer? Just like the, the scientific perspective, the treatment, the clinical, like what, what's been the biggest change mentally, whether it be clinicians or patients that you've seen? Um, that makes sense. I think, I, I mean, I think the biggest change has probably been, uh, you know, what's happened in the laboratory to figure out where do these things come from? What are, you know, what, what do we, what can we learn about the cancer cell that will, that will drive us to figure out better treatments for the patient, as opposed to saying, this is lung cancer, let's operate or radiate or give chemo but just do that, you know, the, the, we're, we're targeting much better, the so-called personalized cancer care. Now, personalized cancer care is a, you know, is a catchphrase that, that makes everybody think, well, it, it will be possible to find a very specific plan for me. That isn't always possible. I mean, very often we're basing our treatments on you know, clinical research that has gone on for decades, but maybe there isn't something new. I think one of the things that is also, I mean, that is important that has changed is that people are willing to talk about this. I mean, uh, you know, back in the, I do remember in the 1970s, I think, um, people just didn't, you know, it, it wasn't something you discussed if you were diagnosed with cancer. Well, I, I had a growth uh, or people bold face names in the news were not talking about it. And, and it, I remember it was kind of a big deal when uh, President Ford's wife, Betty Ford, uh, developed breast cancer. And she was very open about the fact that she was just diagnosed and she's going through treatment and so on. Um, and uh, at the same time, Nancy Reagan, or shortly thereafter, Nancy Reagan, the first lady later, uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer, but that was very hush-hush. I mean, there was some notion that, you know, uh, that she had uh, cancer, but, you know, no one talked about it. Um, so it's, it's, it's much more open. And maybe one of the reasons it's more open too is that there are so many more cancer survivors walking around these days because there has been a lot of progress. Um, and so, you know, people are willing to 
to talk about it and people are willing to to share what they know and people are willing to to you know go around and get opinions and and be open about it 